Hey, I should like to begin this video with two quotes, both from one of my favourite painters, Vincent van Gogh, and they're both words that he wrote his brother Theo in letters. And the first one goes, What am I in the eyes of most people? A non-entity, an eccentric or unpleasant person, someone who has no position in society and never will. In short, the lowest of the low. Alright then, even if that were absolutely true, they should one day like to show through my work what such a nobody had in his heart. It's my ambition, based less on resentment than on love, in spite of it all, based more on a feeling of serenity than on passionate times. I'm often in the depths of loneliness and despair, there's still, at other times, calmness, pure harmony, almost like music in me. I see paintings or drawings in the poorest cottages in the dirtiest corners and my mind is driven towards these things with an irresistible momentum. And the second goes, if one wants to be active, one mustn't be afraid to get something wrong now and again or to lapse into any mistakes. To be a good painter, many people think that they'll achieve it by doing no harm, but it's a lie and you yourself called it that. That way leads to stagnation, mediocrity. Just dash anything on when you see a blank canvas staring at you like some sort of imbecile. You don't know how paralyzing that is. And the stare of the blank canvas, the unfinished canvas that says to the artist, you're not worth a thing. You'll never finish me. It has a mesmerizing stare and many painters are afraid from the blank or half-finished canvas, but the blank canvas is afraid of the true passionate painter who dares and has broken the spell of you can't once and for all. So here you have an image of what you might call two sides of a man. One discouraged and dispirited and convinced that no one gives a damn about him or his work and another who in spite of this and in spite of everything that 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 the world is trying to throw at him was determined to press on with his work and art certainly needs a bit of persistence and courage and daring and the more you paint I think the more you'll come to see that it was never half as hard or complicated or crying of burger or however else level of technical precision all along. And I'll also just briefly here add here that this isn't the first take of this by any means. This is something me and my, uh, my dear friend have been uh, trying to shoot for the last month or so and so many fucking things have gone wrong. The very first video two or three weeks back was compressed at a very low rate, very pixelated and with the audio out of sync it came out and <coughs> Then the original copy was accidentally deleted and the second take a day later was interrupted by a meowing kitten then by a neighbour pouring water over his window midway through for a prank to distract me. I was just about fed up and done with it. I had the script. I was scrolling down the screen of my friend's teleprompter app and his phone before me. But my heart wasn't in the words as I... Uh, as I spoke of things like, you know, love of life and nature, it didn't fucking mean anything. It was shit to me. It was it was all falling apart and I was trying to say all these bright and lofty things, but I just I didn't believe any of it. And then he asked me to come away with him to his far village on the, the border of India and Nepal and it cleared me up a bit. It it calmed me down. I uh, a very wise man once said that when you're feeling in a dark place, the, the way to get out of it isn't to make a list and a correlation and an analysis of all the darkness, it's just to try and bring in a bit of light and the darkness just disappears of its own accord. You don't have to work it all out. Maybe you just look at someone, laugh or smile and it doesn't seem half as complicated as it did once. And yeah, at that I, I began to not miss the internet. I began to feel that, oh, what the fuck, maybe there still are a lot of doors unlocked and open all around us. So, without much further ado, 
let's get stuck into the basics and beyond of how to become an oil painter because it's my sincere belief that anyone can be as fine as beautiful a painter as Mr. Van Gogh or Paul Gauguin or whoever the hell else they set their mind to it and they don't let this world and consequence discourage them so if you'd like to give oil painting a go you'll need to try and get your hands on some of the following the first is an old cigar tin like this one it's not an essential but I just like it the main idea for it though is to keep your q-tips inside of it and it's metal is always nicer than plastic and these q-tips are used for dipping into a dish of paint thinner and then this will dissolve the oil paint so if I've made a mistake on a painting you see like I can't find a good mistake on this but let's say there was a mistake here I'd fucked it up I'd got something in the wrong spot then I can uh, I can rub it out with this so uh, it takes the pressure off if you're not like oh oil painting's too hard because I can't make a mistake no you've got a fucking eraser you can make a gazillion mistakes and you just erase them. It's like drawing something with a pencil. So don't let anyone tell you that you can't make mistakes in oil paintings. I made six fucking billion mistakes in this painting alone, let alone my entire career. The other thing you can do if you make a mistake is you can get a palette knife and you can just simply scratch the paint off. Like, oh fuck, I put that in the wrong spot. And then you'll just scratch it off like that. Um, yeah. Um, oh yeah, so... If you're just starting out in the game and you don't know what else a palette knife is used for, it's also used for moving paint around on the palette and for like mixing up new colours. And the idea is you want all the shit that you're putting together right next to each other. So if I'm creating like this this background here, that's a mixture of yellow ochre, um, uh, what the fuck is that called? Burnt umber and white. So, oh shit man, it's going to take ages. I'm going to have to dip my brush from the ochre to the umber to the white. I can't have that. So we get the palette knife and we scratch up all the umber and we put it all next to each other so it's more economic. Uh, it's just, And then when we want to mix up the, this color for the background, bing bang boom, takes half as much time than if we had to go all the way over there. So that's what you use a palette knife for. And if if you want to try painting with a palette knife, ask someone else because I've never done it and I don't know shit about it. Um, you also need, uh, obviously, some brushes. Um, what, uh, if you give me a second. What I recommend is the following. Oh, fuck, I didn't get anyone near as organized as I should have. Um, uh, uh, let's say four or five. Um, uh, you want like a number one size brush or a fine point brush for doing like all the all the really fine close up details and shit on a portrait. Um, uh, you'll need like an all purpose guy like a, a number two size brush. Um, uh, you'll want a number three and then uh, a couple of bigger ones who gives a shit. Um, uh, just to be specific this is a six and the others are five. Um, uh, and another thing, if you notice the, the, the common thread between all these brushes is they're all made out of sable hair. None of them are made out of synthetic hair. And this is because synthetic hair brushes fray when you dip them in a turpentine or paint thin or whatever the shit you want to call it. And because, you know, it's like a plastic, it's a synthetic fiber, and this is something that eats plastic. And then before you know it, you won't be able to get a straight line out of it. And we can't have that, so just... Save yourself the hassle, get yourself some sable hair brushes so they don't fray. I'm not going to elaborate on that, it's fucking self-explanatory. Um, yeah, just think of it as like trying to draw like a, a picture with a really brunt crayon. What you really want is a sharp crayon or a brush which isn't frayed and for that reason we get sable hair. Um, Oh yeah, I should add that the similar sized two and three point brushes um, are used so that we can uh, switch between colors really easily. So like if we're doing the, this gentleman's shirt and it's red here, and so I'm, uh, I'm doing red 
Oh shit. Well, let, let's say it's blue, but ought to be a bit more specific. It's cobalt here. So we're doing cobalt for his shirt up here. And then what we'd usually have to do is clean this and then go into the red for the red stripe. But if we've got two brushes, then we can just go straight to the red without having to clean it. So it'll save us a bit of time. Um, okay. Yeah, you see these very fine self-portraits of artists like Vincent van Gogh and Virgil Lebrun. These rather beautiful paintings like from my soul brother Vincent van Gogh and the very luscious Virgil Lebrun. Look how luscious she is. <laughs> So sexy, yeah? So sweet. And anyway, these chaps, they're all, uh, you see, they're all holding like four, a whole bunch of brushes at the same time. Never of them are just holding one or two brushes in these portraits. And however long ago that I saw those charming, charming paintings, I theorized that this is so a chap can easily switch between colors like I showed you before without having to fucking honestly wipe the brush each time. Um, okay, we're going to continue on with all the inventory that you need. So you also need a pencil for when you're sketching out your drawing. I think it's a lot easier and quicker to go in with your ideas that have trained on that pot plant. Focus on the pot plant. Look at the pot. Put the camera. The other thing you'll need is a pencil for when you're sketching out your drawing. Train the camera in the pot plant, please, Dad. It's a, a lot easier. Train it back on me. It's a lot easier and quicker to go in with your ideas in pencil first than with than with mixing up all the right colours and cleaning up the br brush a bunch of times to get the outline in. So here I am. I'm just gonna draw this pot plant. You see, if I was to be doing this with brushes, I would have to do like a mixture of hay and fucking umber there to get that pot in. And then I'd be doing like a, a mixture of a whole bunch of different colors here to do this. And I can just, you know, get the outline in with my pencil. And then thereafter, I could get a little bit of green, say, and just start putting the fucking leaves on, right? Bing, bang, boom. You see? And if I had to, like, you know, like, change color and, you know, get the hay and fucking do the... See, it would take ages longer, and it's just simpler, in my opinion, just to go in first with a pencil, and I'm sure... All of these old chaps would have, you know, made their outlines with a pencil and then gone in thereafter and started fucking with colour. Um, what else? You also need two spice dishes. Ooh, look at this. <laughs> and I want to be a little asshole and spill a bunch of dirty fucking taps on the sofa of my hotel, but you get the bit, they're on my titties, and you need this two spice dishes. Why the fuck do you want two or not just one, William? Good question. One of the spice dishes is for turpentine, and the other, we put into it a mixture of turpentine and linseed oil, which you can buy for peanuts at any art store if you're not living in like New York or Paris and London or whatever, in which case they'll bend you over and it'll cost you like fucking 50 bucks. But anywho, enough pissing and moaning and bitching, um, you put half linseed oil and half turpentine. It doesn't have to be exact, you know, the painting's not going to catch fire if it's like 70% turps and 30% fucking linseed oil. And this, my friends, is for lubricating the brush. So, you know, like, here we go, like, oh, the brush is so fucking dry, I can barely get it on, what the fuck? I dip it in the medium, 
And now look how much smoother it goes. Holy shit. Um, and the other dish is for turpentine. So that's for lubricant. Half linseed, half turps. And the other is full turps. And that's when we want to dip it in there. And then put it in the rag. And now we've got a clean brush for when we're, you know, changing to yellow or whatever the hell. Um, you will also need, my friends, the following colours. And, you know, like I said earlier, I'm not here to be dogmatic or to tell anyone what to do. If you get pleasure and joy out of using watercolours or acrylics, do it. Peace and love to all men. Personally, I prefer oils for the very simple reason that they blend together. And, you know, it's so much easier to do a portrait when you're working with oils because you can go in with the flesh colour and paint the whole face with flesh tone. And then, uh, I'm trying to, like, do this in a very fast way, so don't expect, like, the Mona Lisa. Um, you can paint the whole face with flesh tone. And then you can, you know, you can add a shadow with the umber, right? And you wouldn't be able to do that as easily with acrylics because by the time you put this on, 10 minutes later, it's going to set. So you'd have to paint the entire face in like 10 minutes. I have no clue how people do portraits with acrylics. Some chaps can do it. It seems a little taxing for me. For me, it's just a hell of a lot easier to just... Even for landscapes, just to have that lovely, lovely, lovely capacity to blend colours. To be like, you know, oh, that's too blue, so we're going to put some more some more yellow in it to make it more green. Or some more white in it. And we have one to two days that we have this latitude before the paint sets. And you'd probably have about that latitude for about ten minutes before it sets with acrylics. Anywho, that's why I like to use oils. As far as to if you're just starting out, what oils do you need? I'm going to tell you real quick. And you can divide these into three categories. Brother. Um, firstly, primary colours, which of course are red, yellow, blue. Um, secondary, shades, which are white and black. And lastly, what I would like to call auxiliary colours. As for the primary colours, I like lemon yellow, that's that gorgeous fluorescent yellow. Dev, would you kindly put it on that leaf there? A few chaps will look at this leaf, look how fucking bright yellow it is. It's like flashing, it's gorgeous, we're alive, we're in nature, we're young, you know. It's that charming yellow. If I want to recreate that on a canvas, that, that bright verdure, I'm going to need lemon yellow. And then I could put it in with a bit of green. Um, we're going to need ultramarine. This is called ultra blue for some reason, fuck knows. Um, we're going to need navy blue, because blue, you know, it can't get darker. You know, you can't add black to blue to make it get darker. Um, we may need to cut soon, um, because, you know, then you're just going to end up with cobalt. So, if you want darker blue, like for a skyline or like star note of the Rhone, you're going to need Pasalo blue, Prussian blue, navy blue, it's all the same thing. You'll need primary blue, maybe they call it sky blue, for painting the skyline. And you'll need chrome yellow for just, it comes up all the time, I'm not going to explain why you need chrome yellow. Um, you need red, pretty obvious, um, um, as far as blue, greens go, there's so much fucking green in nature, just put it on this garden for a second, Dev, look how much goddamn green is there, Dev, you need to come back, the microphone's really shit, they won't be able to hear me if you spend too much time, Dev, come back, um, alright, where was I, um, so there's like a gazillion different greens, so did differentiate against them all, you need as much ammunition as you can. Emerald green, which looks like yeah, this, 
mid green, which is like basically like all purpose green, sap green, hand me the stupid paint, this one, which is like, how the fuck would I describe sap green? It's just like, it's like a dirty green, um, uh, it's really good for, fuck it, just buy it, you know, you're not gonna buy it and like be painting for a week and be like, oh, what do I do with the sap green? No, you're gonna identify sap green in nature and start using it. Uh, also, you'll need brown, which in the biz we call burnt sienna. You'll need dark brown, which in the biz we call burnt umber. And you'll need hay colour, which in the biz we call yellow ochre or raw sienna. So feel free to just like take note of all this and then go into the art store and buy it. You'll also, if you intend to paint portraits, which I highly recommend, need something called portrait tone. You can't call this like flesh tone anymore because that's racist and I wouldn't dream of being a racist because yeah. Uh, okay um uh, so we've covered all the colors um, um just, da -da -da -da, I'm just gonna wait for the teleprompter to catch up and then you will need some card to use as a palette. Um, for instance, this. And this can be bought in a framing store. If you're living in Nepal or India, just wherever they put, you know, photographs and frames, it goes in the back of it, they'll sell it to you for 10 rupees, 25 rupees a pop. And then you can just paint on it like this. And whenever it gets fucked up, just throw it in the bin. And probably like one painting, you know, will one bit of card and another thing you can do if you can be bothered which I stopped doing is is like trace a little thumb hole here with a pencil and then use a, a box cutter to cut that out and then you could in fact hold it like that but you, you could just as easily hold it like that and save yourself the effort and if it's only gonna last you a couple of days and fuck it mate. Um, if you're not lucky enough to live in India or Nepal, <laughs> it's okay. And you live in another country where you don't have access to a framing store, get one of these knives. Stanley knife, box cutter, exacto knife, whatever. Um, and then go up to like a fucking cardboard box and cut the flap off with a knife. And this is my art box, so I'm not going to destroy it, but you get the idea. And then you have a little palette. And it's a disposable palette. So yeah. What else? Um, you'll need some rags or paper towel for when you want to clean the brushes, as I showed you earlier. And then for transporting all of the brushes, you can put the towel down like this, put all the brushes in here like this, fold it up, wrap it up like a delicious fucking burrito, and roll it up. Um, sadly I was not prepared enough to find a, a hair tie from upstairs, but usually you have a hair tie and you just wrap it around it and then that'll keep your brushes from getting damaged when you put them in your pack to go out look for a model or a nice landscape to paint and um, that'll keep all the bristles from getting damaged. You'll need an easel and turn it on the easel brother and these can easily be acquired from an art store or off eBay. Just search for folding tripod easel and if this is the thing to be your your best buddy and to stick with you for however long. Um, they build these strong, so maybe it'll stick with you to the bitter end. Um, what you can do, which I like to do, is add an inspiring quote at the bottom that you can draw strength from when the going gets tough. And here I've got, the blank canvas is afraid of the true passionate painter who dares. Also, if Fixed there, please turn the camera here. Also, you can affix a little plastic cup to the side of your easel, 
and this is for a chap to put his spice dish in, and this I found at the top of a, a pepper jar at my beloved landlord Larry Coleslaw's place, and I, I fixed it with masking tape, and I can put my, uh, my medium here, so when I'm painting my friends, I can just quickly dip, come here. I can quickly dip it into the, the medium and then uh, have lubricant very close by at hand. All right. Um, and your last but not least need <coughs> a smooth surface to paint on. Do you know, under any circumstances, my friends begin to paint on a cotton canvas or canvas board with a rough weave that you might find in an art store. Painting on such a rough surface can be attempted, can be likened to trying to make a drawing on sandpaper with a bunch of crayons. I don't have crayons, so we're just going to have to do the example with a pencil. Sure, you can get there in the end, but look how fucking rough it is. And there's going to be like a whole bunch of holes where the paint, the paint doesn't apply to, because look, I'm trying to go here and this rough shit, and it doesn't get in there. That's probably even better than cotton. I'd probably rather paint on sandpaper than I would on fucking cotton. Um, so, sure, you could go into an art store and buy a cotton weave, but it's going to take ten times as long and be twice as taxing, and just paint on something smooth. I'm not going to waffle on. <coughs> um, it's an impediment that you don't need. Um, and it's ultimately going to make a painting that you could knock out on linen or plywood in an afternoon take you like a week. So just don't be a fool, get, get something smooth. Uh, as far as to where can I purchase this plywood, go to like um, uh, a furniture store, go to a Leroy Mar Merlin if you're in Paris or Home Depot if you're in America or Bunnings if you're in Australia and better yet ask them if they have MDF board because that's not gonna that's not gonna warp if it's exposed to moisture and excessive heat in the way that plywood would. Um, for the linen you can either go to a tailor and say uh, could I have some yards of linen or you could go on eBay and get it. But you must remember to prime the linen with a roller before stapling it or mounting it to your frame because otherwise it's going to sag with the, the weight of all the water and the primer and you're just going to need to restretch it again. So buy the linen from the tailor or off eBay, roll it out, prime it with a roller and then uh, you know staple it to your canvas stuff or whatever the fuck it's called. Well, that's everything you'll need for making a painting. But you're for making a painting. But you'll need a few other auxiliary things to sustain yourself and to make sure you pass a comfortable day out in the field. One of these is a metal canteen. Metal just feels nicer than plastic. I should think it's, I'm not going to do that again, it's more durable and earnest and you feel a little like a soldier and also you don't get all the harsh chemicals when the sun comes down and like fucking with its evil rays melts the plastic into the water. Go with metal if you can. Um, you'll need, where's my cap? Where's my cap? Where's my cap? Okay. Are we rolling? You'll also uh, definitely need a wide brim cap for the sun. That's great. Uh, an umbrella with a stake. I don't have a stake to show you all. Oh, maybe I fucking do. Yes, I do. Um, if you have a, a stake like this, and the umbrella. <laughs> oh, that's ridiculous. Um, uh, you can pop the fucking umbrella, bang, unroll this fucking shit from the bottom, and just fucking take this fucker to it, and just 
bang it into the ground, and you're good to go. Um, what else? Um, and that'll keep maybe like some of the rain off you, and maybe some of the sun off you, whatever. Um, alternatively, you can go into a restaurant that's nearby to where you're painting, and can you, you can say to them, could I kindly borrow a terrace or a beach and grill if you've got it? And they uh, very well might say yes. Um, of course, you want some mosquito repellent, and for better or worse, we're living through coronavirus. And so, if you buy like lunch and you get money, just fucking spray your hands with this shit and rub them, and then you very well can dodge a bullet. Um, you'll also want, if I have it here, please tell me what I do, an LED headlamp. And this comes in handy, uh, it doesn't really, you can't really see it now because it's so bright, for when, you know, the sun starts to go down and you're painting at dusk. Um, if you can't find one of those, what you can do is turn the fucking flashlight on in your phone and with some masking tape, affix it to the top of your easel. I'm not going to do it now, but you get the gist. Um, one should also bring a pillow and some sort of fold out fishing camping stool with them to sit on. And if you're worried about getting your pillow dirty, you can put it in a, a reusable shopping bag like this, and then you can put it in the wet grass and dirt and shit, and it's not going to get effed up. Um, and if you're working far from a restaurant, or in a, a country where you can afford to eat out, then make sure you bring some snacks. Make a sandwich, grab an apple, trail mix, um, perhaps something salty, perhaps something sweet, um, perhaps a cheese, perhaps a peach, if you're lucky enough to live in a country where it's peach season. Dev is also displaying some raisins. Dev, do you have any suggestions for snacks? Chaps, can you... Yeah, I like fruit. I do like it. Dev is recommending uh, Proto, which is a sort of alu Proto. How would you describe that? It's like a, a fucking uh, alu, which is potato, potato cake. Um, um, and this last one's a doozy. And I'm not here to be dogmatic or to tell anyone what to do, but personally, um, I like to treat painting like a full-time job. And so I try not to bring my phone out with me when I'm working, and rather I bring a wristwatch. Not unsimilar to this one, or perhaps entirely similar to this one, because this is my wristwatch that I bring. And then I leave my uh, lovely iPhone at home, and then all from, if I'm lucky enough to get up at dusk and work from dusk till dawn, all for 12 hours, I can say I've been working, I haven't been distracted, I haven't been fucking around, I've just been working. And if you bring your phone out, it's just one thing leads to another, and I think, you know, I'm not going to be cynical, because I'm not about being cynical. But I think a lot of these, you know, programs and companies, they profit from just like tying you with ropes to your chair and tying the fucking phone before you like something out of a clockwork orange. And it's just like one thing, another thing. And, you know, they say one drink is too many and thousands never enough. It's the same with YouTube. It's the same with Spotify. They just want to like more, more, more time in and get those adverts playing before I'm... I said I was trying not to be cynical. Oh. Anyway, if you just bring a wristwatch, then you're not, you're not going to be prone to all of that. And then when you go home at night and you sit before your mirror and you try to work on a self-portrait, maybe you can put on some Tchaikovsky on a symphony and listen to that while you work on a portrait. But these wonderful fellows like Monet and Van Gogh and Gauguin, they didn't have access to, you know, constant ubiquitous information. And... Look how much more productive they were. They were getting like a painting done a day. So for that reason, personally, I'm not here to tell anyone what to do. I like to go out with only the wristwatch, and then all day, 
all you're allowed to do is paint. As you have two options, you can sit down and do nothing, or you can paint. And because sit down, sitting down and doing nothing is a whole lot more boring than fooling around on a phone, more likely than not, from you know 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., you're going to be working, and you'll probably, if you're very lucky and you can sink it right, going to be going home with a painting a day, which is fucking amazing. Um, <clears throat> when I used to work for a very dear friend of mine as a groundskeeper and cleaner at his lodge in Brisbane, I was not allowed to listen to my iPod as I worked. And so I, I, just, I like to take it, treat it as a full-time job and like a professional job that you have to attend to it at the same time every morning and then you're not allowed to piss around and let yourself be distracted on and productivity goes right up. Um, as for if a fellow starts a portrait of someone in the day and they have to leave before it's through, um, I think most chaps carry phones in them these days, and you can then just ask the person to either sit for you again tomorrow, or if this isn't possible, then just kindly ask them if you can take a photograph of them on their phone, <coughs> and uh, then they can send this to you on Facebook Messenger or by email or whatever you use, and then yeah. When you're back home in your atelier or room or veranda or whatever you use as a studio, you can get the image back up and finish it from there. If you do decide to go out without a phone, um, I would recommend that you bring a notebook with you for any thoughts or notes that you might want to jot down throughout the day. For instance, interesting bits of conversation <coughs> that you might use in a letter or a journal or a novel or a short story or ideas for scenes that you may wish to paint later, so that you might see on the way to work, you might pass a very stunning bridge and you'll jot down in here, oh, the bridge on the way to SETI, and then you can come back to work. Um, make sure you bring a good book if you're not bringing a phone, because then if it gets rained out and you have to go and sit in a restaurant for like an hour or two while you wait for the rain to pass and you don't have a phone, you've got something to do. Um, alternatively, you could bring a sketch pad and ask a pretty girl in the restaurant if you could draw her while you wait for the rain to pass. This book I'm holding up is very, very, very dear to me. It's The Great Gatsby. It's lovely. If you haven't read it, I'd highly recommend it. It's about a man who tries to act with dignity. What a wonderful thing to try to treat our fellow sister and brother with dignity and respect. That was this gentleman right here stunningly evoked, so evocatively and wonderfully and poetically evoked by Mr. Fitzgerald, and he got shot in the end, which was very tragic, and at the end of the day, I think Gatsby believed in hopefulness, and I think there's a message in that for all of us. If things are shit, if the girl you love doesn't love you back, try to hope that, you know, tomorrow you'll run faster, you'll stretch out your arms a little wider and you'll you'll go back into the past, back into that beautiful innocence of childhood, you know, Alex Ward in a cupboard, five minutes in heaven at, you know, Brooke Hagen's party, you know, you're rolling back to, you know, Europe and Paris for the first time when it was so fresh and wonderful and you'll get there, you know, one one fine morning, one fine morning. Jay Gatsby, love it. Anyhow I digress. Well, that covers the basic inventory that can be expanded on and find as you go. You've got your smooth surface to paint on, so you won't be messing around with the rough surface and filling in depressions in the weave for long, tedious, painstaking days. You've got your conviction from Gauguin that there's a, there's a certain poetry to the natural world, and that certainly includes the, the unaffected and genuine man or woman as much as all the lovely butterflies and kittens and... The beauty of life, my friends, the beauty and at times wonderful innocence of life and people, you know. You can come in with all these theories and ideas and men are jerks and women are lazy and then you look at someone's smile or laugh or tell a joke or tell you about the time that they felt pain and all the noise goes away, you know, like how quick, you know. All other passions do fleet to ours, doubtful thought and rash and grace despair. The love be moderate, lay thy ecstasy, for I fear I may so fit.
Yeah, life can be wonderful, that's what I'm trying to say. You're ready to go, you got all your shit. But first, a few precepts. Painting is a mixture of two things. It's a mixture of getting the shapes right, getting everything where you want it to be. And for that, you could go on in pencil. You could draw this building first when you're just starting out. And then, once you've got the shapes right, you need to get the colors right. You need to be like, okay, that's green, that's whatever the fuck. Um, as far as nature goes, just try. It can be overwhelming when there's a billion leaves and a billion different colors before you. And I think you're never going to be able to draw every single leaf and every single blade of grass and every single flower and every single cloud exactly the same. And so what I think you can only ever try to do is just give an impression of it. Give a quick impression of how pretty it was, how it made you feel. Or maybe it's really, you're feeling really desolate and low, so you go and you look at something that's dying and that's losing the fight and it's really withered. And just try and give an impression of it. You know, you don't punish yourself if you don't get it exactly the same. I think it's physically impossible to do that. Maybe if you God would. Um, maybe watch a video tour on perspective and proportion before you start off. Download the WikiArt app and look at some of the Monets or Van Goghs or Gauguins for inspiration before you go out. And yeah, it's quite alright to abridge things and you know, you just plant, say it's too hard to draw, uh, and so you, you cut it and you know, no one's ever going to come and say, uh, I don't know if you know this, but that plant is actually not included in your painting. Who gives a shit? Just do what you want. Do what makes you happy. Um, fill the canvas, and when the canvas is full, then the painting will be complete. Um, I think all painting is, is a long list of things to fix up. And as you sit there fixing things up, the, this list will dwindle down and dwindle down. There's a finished one. And at one stage, that looked like this. And you know, you look at this, and there's like, I don't know, let's say like 100 things that need to be added. And you're slowly subtracting them. You're adding this here, you're adding that there, you're fixing this up. This was darker, you know, that was darker. There's green in between that, you know, this isn't finished. This sky could be more vivid. This building needs to go in. And Basically, it's a mathematical certainty. If you get a number like 360 and you subtract 2 from it one minute and 3 from it the next minute, eventually in a few days it's going to get down to zero. You know, if you take the HMS Titanic and you put some water in it, some more water in it, and some more water in it, eventually it's going to sink. You keep working on it, you keep honing it, you keep honing it. However hard, however fucked, however impossible it seems, if you keep on chipping away at it, the more work you put into it, the more you get things to your liking with a relatively clear head, the better it's going to look. It's an inevitability. The, the blank canvas can never defeat the true artist. The only thing the blank canvas can try to do to the artist is psych him out. But if the artist keeps his conviction, keeps honing it, slow and steady, from sun up to sundown, an inevitability that he's going to finish that painting and he's going to get it the way he wants it to look. Um, well, that's natural scenes. As far as portraiture goes, you may need a little instruction first if you're just starting out. First of all, you'll need a model. Try getting a mirror and setting it up on a chair before you. This can be a good help too if you don't particularly like the way you look. Zebraing your face for so long as you attempt to paint it might remind you that you're not as ugly as you once thought you were or as your subconscious told you were. Or perhaps you might try asking a friend or a family member if they should like to sit for you. Or asking if you can put up a sign in your favourite local restaurant. Say something to the effect of, artists looking for live models to hone his craft. Free drink or meal or coffee for anyone who sits for me. Kindly contact Melissa, Joseph, Greg, whatever your name is, on whatever your best line of contact is. Oh. If you already have everything you need to paint on, as you're heading out to look for a natural motif, you might pass a, a pretty or interesting looking stranger, and you could try asking them if they should like to sit for you. And I understand that this might be a little daunting at first, so you might need to take yourself aside for a moment and give yourself a little 
pep talk, perhaps something to the effect of, just try it, man, what's the worst that could happen? They could laugh in your face and tell you to get lost. Okay then, then what? Would that kill you? If, you, if you've asked the person sincerely and kindly, would be anything you needed to feel guilty about thereafter? A very dear friend of mine once said to me that he believed confidence isn't, you know, believing you're the best in the world. It's, it's just thinking that this isn't okay, this isn't alright, this is a permissible thing that I'm doing. It's not thinking, you know, this person's definitely going to say yes to me. It's just thinking, asking someone if I can paint them is a, a perfectly okay thing to ask. And she might think, oh, what a fun way to spend an afternoon. Yeah, I'd love to. Um... And people in my experience have been known to say yes, and sure, some models have been, well, shall I say, eager and keen to sit for you than others, but the model who says to you, you know, am I sitting still enough, you know, I can pose to as long as you want, I'm sure it look, it's going to look great, everything you do looks awesome, she's... The model who wants to be painted, she's out there. And when you paint her, say the embodiment of just a sense of love or, or, or peacefulness, you'll, uh, you'll instantly be able to see it in the finished work. You know, I've, I've made certainly not a lot of paintings like this, but a few where I've been either looking at or thinking of a lady and painting her and thinking, Gee, this person was really kind to me. This is this is really a sweet girl. This is someone who uh, perhaps was something of a sister to me when I wasn't as as close as I I would have liked to have been with my actual sister. And this is I I remember just up the road here. Um, I saw a friend and she uh, she recommended me. I'd been telling her, you know. Oh, I want to meet more women, I'm sick of being lonely, I'm sick of looking at dirty videos of girls on the internet, I want to be a person like all the others, I want to ask girls if I can paint them, but I don't have the guts to do so. And she's like, oh, well, what you want to do first is, like, put your medical, metaphorical armor on, you know, just take a deep breath and breathe your, your armor or your courage or your shield on or whatever. I was like, hmm, I put it in my brain and I, you know, crunched it over a little bit. And and then I saw her again just down the road, and she said, "Ah, oh, hey, Will, you've got your armor on." And I made a painting of this person, and if you look at it, you can see it, that it's painted very softly. So that's the that's the beauty of painting, you know. If if we uh, if we fade away from this world, we can leave this little shadow of you know love, and you can look at a painting that. Virgie Lebrun did of her herself and her daughter hundreds of years ago during the fucking French Revolution, 300 odd years ago. And you can look at that and you can be like, ah, oh, that's human love, that's, that's, uh, that's human peacefulness, that's human joy. And it's, it's charming, it's nice to look at. I could stand before those paintings for a fucking afternoon. Um, just as you can see it in Vincent's Peasant Girl in a Cornfield, I should expect. I'll try and get some cut-ins here and iMovie or whatever. Um, anyway, before you add the colour, you want to know how to draw a face first. Because, you know, get the shape in the face in the right place and then add the colour. Bing, bang, boom. So anyway, quick tutorial on how to draw a face. And I like to quote an old friend of mine, Momad, if you kill me, I just come back in you. I'm Momad with your face. Wise words indeed. Um, uh, anywho, I like to start with the nose. I'm gonna give him a big old Jewish nose. <laughs> then uh, the eyes. To, to gauge in where the lips should go. Um, uh, we'll draw these eyes here. I'm gonna draw this eye as a star, you know, just for shits and giggles. 
and uh, and you're you're using it because you know if you draw the lips first, then you know you got to dick up your ass because they might be too big or whatever the hell else. I'm gonna give um, a little cutie, a little furred brow to like you know ratchet up the sex appeal. We're gonna add some shading to the star eye. Uh, some sexy fucking curls. Nice. Not too big tits, because you know, I mean, there's a time and a place for everything, right? And then, you know, we'll put some hair here. Maybe she's gonna be like smoking like, like a dead parrot that's like smoking a cigarette, that's like smoking, drinking milk out of a straw from one of her breasts. Um, the, the human hand is, you know, roughly the same size as a face, and we're gonna give her another cigarette, and no, actually, it's gonna be a pipe full of fucking DMT, nice. Uh, <laughs> and, yeah, you know, <laughs> that's pretty much how you draw relatively realistic looking face maybe you can have it with like an AR-15 and you know like then we can put in the background 2020 Trump you know that's a nice message um what was his fucking tweet today it was like it was like vote for me what the hell else are you gonna do <laughs> you know it's like <laughs> this man is not so this is this is not someone you want to be leading the free world. Let's get really political here. Let's like discuss the situation in Uganda. Um, anyway, so you're using like perspective to be like, you know, you look at someone's chin and if you've done the chin too big, then you can sort of be like, oh, the chin's only meant to go down to here. And if you've done the lips too big, you can be like, oh, they're meant to go in. Or like, when I first drew this gentleman's eye, it was like going this way, so I literally had to paint it. So don't let anyone fob you off. You see these fucking tutorials on the fucking YouTube, and it's like someone will paint something that looks like a fucking ing, and like fucking, uh, like a condensed like six minutes without making a single mistake, and it's just a jerk off their ego. It's literally like, Oh yeah, I can paint something that looks like a fucking old master in like six minutes and then I'm just gonna put a bunch of drips down the side of it. That's not what... I mean, good luck to them, you know, I'm sure they're charming people and I'm sure their art's beautiful. What, who am I to be cynical about them, you know? Stop being such an asshole. Calm down. Um... Yes. Um, if you're just starting out, what I find helped me a lot and how to draw a face was looking at all of the Junji Ito comics on Google. I'm trying to copy how he draws faces. He has a rather simple and effective way of doing so. Dev, where the fuck are you going? Go Dev, walk. Dev, you can't just walk off in the middle of the take. You're the worst cameraman ever. Continue. No, you, you, this is so unprofessional. Yeah. Um, okay, um, no, no, that's good. Why was I? Junji Ito comics. You try to copy them and how he draws faces. He has a rather simple and effective way of doing so. Defining the nose and the lips in just a couple of lines, like this. <laughs> so beautiful. And then uh, he'll draw like a nose, like this. And then like one eye will be here, and then like another eye will be here, and then like she'll have like these huge breasts that are just like just about ready to pop out of her top, and she'll have like these sexy curls, you know, like the sweet furrowed brow, you know, she'll be like smoking a cigarette that has like a little fucking Nazi flag hanging out of the end of it. What the? F what would he even do that for? That is so weird. And yeah, so that's a little bit about Mr. Ido. So, <coughs> I spent a couple of evenings to, you know, try and copy his work. That was just goofing around. He doesn't draw like that. I'll put up some mock-ups of what he actually draws like. And yeah, 
that's that's literally how I learned how to draw. And then once you can do that, it's a hop, skip, and a jump to adding the color. For a Caucasian person, put on a tube of let's go, bro. Come on, dude. Portrait tone. Uh, <laughs> um, it's like this sort of color. And then from there, once you've put the portrait tone on, um, hold up, bro. Stay there. You can uh, sort of like all this is like portrait tone, right? <laughs> and then you can put in the rose for the cheeks. You can put in like a bit of umber there. You can cut in a bit of umber there. You can, you know, put in a bit of whatever. But it all just just portrait tone on the whole face, and then like some white and some whatever. However, not everyone in this world is Caucasian. So if you want to just paint someone with a darker complexion, I find uh, Sienna works, and then you can put um, um, ochre in, and if you want to go lighter, you can do like Sienna and rose and white. But you know, it's not technical. It's not like one size fits all and always do it these ways and these rules aren't made to be broken. No, you literally just looking at something. No one fucking told me how to do that. And I'm sure there's plenty of different ways to how to paint a darker or white person because, you know, you don't know what you're doing and it's trial and error. And it's not like you always do it this way, you always make up a face this color. All it is is looking at a face and being like, what color is this? Oh, I think that it's this color and it's a little bit of that. It's not like, you know, there's one formula that you always have to do. Um, this is stupid. And in the words of is it Claude Monet, no, Ed Edward Manet, yeah, um, he said, In art, there's only one true thing paint instantly what you see. When you've got it, you'll know. When you don't, you begin again. So it's how it is, you know? It doesn't, it doesn't have to. Doesn't have to. You don't have to be coming from like a vast technical knowledge before you begin attempting to paint. You know that's fucked. You know you, you just give it a shot. See what you come up with. Uh, see see what the the color looks like. Then try and synthesize that. See what it looks like to you. And try and synthesize that with the basics, which is like sienna and umber and yellow ochre and a bit of white for why it's lighter. Bit of umber for why it's darker, and yeah, just have a muck around. If it doesn't look right, if it doesn't feel right, rub it out, have another crack, get the shape in first. Oh yeah, that's a that's a really fucking important tip that I totally glossed over. So that painting, this painting, they all started, and I'm literally gonna be serious because I've been fucking around too much. They started in this sort of way of just like an outline of a face like this. This gentleman was like an outline of a face and then shoulders and then here and then here and then uh, to try and and then to try and um, gauge where the eyes and the nose go we just do a line here and a line here and then we sort of you know put the put the eyes in put the other eye in put the eyebrows in put the nose in put the lips in and art is a story of a, a whole bunch of rectifications. You're not going to paint it looking perfectly in, in one shot if you're going for, for realism. You're going to make a bunch of mistakes and a bunch of honements and a bunch of improvements. So like this painting like that would have started off looking, uh, I don't like the word crappy, but just somewhat rough. And as you're going, you're refining it. And it's sort of like a, it's a trick on your mind because things don't look great just out the gate and you can be like, oh it looks so terrible, but the thing is, you're trying not to let yourself get discouraged, so when something's in the elementary stage, it doesn't look like a, an amazing finished painting, but you've just got to stick at it, and because it will come good in the end, because the more you hone it, the better it's going to look, so, you know, you, you keep going, you keep on rectifying anything you don't like, you rectify it, obviously this would all, all the things that we don't want would be rubbed away in an oil painting, which is why it's better than a pen drawing. 
you see you see what I mean guys like it's like a whole bunch of rectifications as you go you know this eye could probably stand to be a bit over and this could probably stand to be a bit here and that could stand to be a bit here. that's why I, uh, I I try to love everyone but I don't really like these videos where it's just painting something that looks like you know like an old master without making a single mistake in in six minutes because that's never been what painting by hand has been to me it's been about making a whole bunch of mistakes but rectifying them so they uh, they get closer and closer to what you want to look and so it's sort of like if you if you when i painted this lady here for instance this shoulder here was way too fucking high and so i had to cut it down here and deb was here and when i painted her behind it was way too low it was like down here so we had to move it up there so it obviously didn't start out looking like that it started out with like a pencil drawing and a line down here and a line there so things aren't going to look perfectly right out the gate and you keep going we don't have much data so we have to go fast um oil painting isn't half as hard or requiring a you know perfection as a lot of people make it out to be you know i uh i uh, tried my hand at skateboarding when i was a young man and i uh, really liked this guy in the skateboarding shop and you know i thought oh skateboarding it has to be perfect you have to know what you're doing and it's just like it's trial and error and it's the same thing with painting you know it doesn't have to be perfect it's trial and error and a lot of the reason why we love the van goes so much is because they're you know imperfect they're a little bit raw like he does like a really beautiful painting and like a, a woman's hand will be like too big and he just didn't see it and it's a mistake or you know he's not living in the age of, days of photography so he's only got you know until someone says oh excuse me i'm so sorry mr van gogh but it's very late and i must be leaving and he's got like a, a hand that's unfinished and he just does it the best he can and that's what's so beautiful about it he's an everyman he's a, a bum for lack of a better word who's giving it a shot and nobody really gives a shit nobody's like oh wow Vincent, that's so interesting, they could give a fuck. And that's that's me. Nobody gives a fuck about my work. Very, very few people say, oh, it's interesting and talented. But you press on. And that's why it's it's true, Mr. Van Gogh's work. And I'm not shitting on realism, because I love so many realistic paintings, but there's many ways to, to skin a cat. And yeah, it doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, if it's a little bit raw, maybe there'll be beauty in that. Well, uh, there's, that's pretty much all I've learned about oil painting. Oh, fuck. The umbrella stand. Um, so, uh, this is my umbrella stand. So, a fellow can be like, oh no, global warming, it's too hot to paint out. Oh, he can make an umbrella stand for himself. And if I can find the fucking umbrella, what the hell is yeah. it? Oh. Um, uh, then we uh, pop the umbrella. Shit. Oh, we, uh, if we had masking tape, you'd get the idea. It's probably not around. We would tape it onto here and then we would sit on a pillow or a stand beneath it and it would be able to keep cool. And you know, the idea is you're trying to spread positivity or if you don't have positivity, you're trying to show your sadness. Or, I don't even know. Who fucking knows? I'm not fucking Mahatma Gandhi. I don't have all the answers. But you know, it's, it's very hot these days. Unfortunately, that's the situation at hand. And you literally can't paint out with just a hat on your head, so you need an umbrella on you too. So if you get a, a base of wood and a plank of wood like this and some nails, you can very easily knock this up. Um, I should I forget if it was a teleprompter. Um, okay, closing remarks. 
I just want to weep. I just want to cry. I just want to hold my head in my hands and cry. You know, I've got here on the screen before me like, Oh, I hope I've inspired you to fucking bloody bloody blah. And I had this whole sentimental speech that I wrote out, but... I'm not really feeling it. And then I've got all the little plugs that... I'm meant to say and bloody bloody blah. This is even like an old script that I should have rewrote. But I'm gonna stop rambling. Um, or maybe I ramble more. This fucking water bottle, you know, this fucking. Uh... And anyway, yeah, in closing, I think you can be at peace with yourself. Anyone can. From the. Most violent dictator to the the guy in the in the street who's suffering the, the yoke of his abuses, and it can be a, a really nice feeling to be at peace with yourself. And anyone can create beautiful, realistic paintings, just as stirring as any of the old masters or Van Gogh or Gauguin or whoever else is. And you can go through a lot of crap and a lot of stress and a lot of tension. And it can feel like the vice is tightening around you so tight that you just want to end your life to make it all and everyone else go away. But you can come out the other side. For loft is seen, and our means secure us, while our mere defects prove our commodities. Anyway, I've got a Patreon where you can uh, see all my paintings for only $5 a month. And I'll also upload two or three new ones a week is the plan. And I'm going to put my little novel about Pablo Picasso on there too, if you'd like to see it. There'll be a link in the description below. And if you enjoyed this, uh, you're welcome to like and subscribe to it. And it might help me a little to, you know, rummage up some cash to buy some more paints. Not visit any prostitutes with. And... I'd like to close by saying in the words of Sean McAuliffe, um, in these crazy, some might say insane times of ours, don't forget that a little love often goes a very long way. Thank you for watching. Peace out. I was the love heart too gay, and we'll cut that out. <laughs>